see the difference. Mm -hmm. Hey, so if we'll talk about different types of deals, whether you're going to wholesale them, how to look at them, and maybe other deals that you might uh, want to keep as rentals. So when you're looking at deals, you need to have good information. You need to have good data. Um, one area you can get that data and look to look at properties is online. We saw before that the last, here's realtor.com, and then there's also truly and Zillow. Those are websites that are free to the public. Anyone can go on to look at data on the houses for your comps. What is better than the, uh, the free websites is what we use as real estate agents and what appraisers use, the MLS. Realtors just create organization for real estate agents. But realtors, appraisers, and real estate investors who have a license or access to an agent who has access to the MLS can get good data, the best data, from the MLS. Our local MLS is Trend. They're out of King of Prussia. What's so special about the MLS is you get the best comps, and that's very, very important when you're analyzing deals. You know, where the, your ARV really is and what your value really should be when you're looking at a deal. So our MLS is, it's trend. We do about two and a half million listings per year. There's about 28,000 agents in, in our MLS, which is the greater Philadelphia area, Delaware Valley. It actually just got bigger in the past year. So here's a map. It goes all the way up, Berkeley, High County, Schuylkill County for your public records. And then now it goes even further into Maryland, all of Delaware, and half of New Jersey. So this, this map is, is a little older. The new, the new MLS coverage is bigger than that. Um, the MLS is in two parts. One part public record, and one part MLS listings, where, where there's rental listings for properties for rent, and commercial listings for, proper, for commercial properties for sale, and then your residential, which is the, the big part of it, all of the, um, the residential properties. So our area covers a huge number of counties in, in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland for public record information to find out recent, you know, who owns it, mortgage information, some basic things that are available through the public record. And the other half is the MLS with those listings. So when using the MLS, you really have to pay attention to a lot of different things. Um, when you're looking at comps for a particular city, say Philadelphia, you have to, you have, to have an awareness of, of certain things, like pockets. Pockets are areas that are very uh, volatile. So Kensington and Fishtown. Fishtown is very big. A lot of activity. Kensington is starting to heat up as well, so now it's called Kishtown. But the point is, not all of Kensington is a great area to buy. It's not, not every street or block in Kensington is a great place. On the edge, bordering Fishtown is great. So the whole idea there is there's pockets in every neighborhood that are really good or not so good. So you, have to, you really have to be wareful of, of what those pockets are. And the MLS can help you do that by looking at you know, the values in this area compared to the values in this area. Block by block, values can change 5,000, 10,000. So look at where the, the subject property is and what's going on from street to street. Boundary roads, um, particularly in the city and sometimes out in the suburbs, you know, Roosevelt Boulevard and, and, and Broad, a lot of times those main roads determine values you know, from one side of the street to the other. So always be wareful of that particularly because out in the suburbs, your boundary roads may determine you know, the difference of a county or may determine the difference of a school district. So you have to be wareful of what, what, the, uh, what those are. Subdivisions are very easy to count because you have a lot of homes built in an area that are very similar with a lot of data. If there's two, 300 homes in a subdivision, there could be six homes for sale at any given time in a regular market, and there might be three or four recently sold, and maybe one or two that are pending. So you have good, a good array of data for an area with very similar homes. So it makes it very easy to, to comp the subdivisions. 
usually they're in larger, you know, they, they've gotten larger, the subdivisions, too. Um, you're able to look at comps that are further away um, in, in the suburbs. You, you may not have to use comps that are necessarily down the block because you're, you're in a larger proximity, maybe across the, you know, maybe two developments over for one that was built, in the, a subdivision that was built in the same era as the subject property that you're looking into would be a good comp. So it may not have to be in that specific neighborhood. Schools have a huge impact on the, the value of homes in the suburbs. You gotta check the school ratings. Fortunately for us in Bucks and Montgomery County, we have excellent school districts, some of the best in the nation. But there's still, still differences between school districts, particularly the taxes. Tax, the school taxes have a huge impact on uh, what the overall taxes are for that property and the desirability of it from one school district to another. So criteria that makes a good comp. So if your subject property, if you're analyzing a subject property, you want to be comparing it to other properties that are as similar as possible. Is it in the same area? Is it in the same township? Is it in the same school district? We don't want to be comparing one property that's in, ta in township A to a property that's in township B that handles things differently, or, or school district A to school district B. We want to be like to like as much as possible. If it's three bedroom, you want to be comparing to three or four bedrooms, but not two or one. Same with baths. Square foot, you want to look at the interior square foot of a property and make sure that the subject property and the comp properties that are using are equal or as close as possible. It's, it's pretty basic stuff. You don't want to be comparing a property that's 1,000 square foot to a property that's 3,000 square foot and doing an adjustment. It, it just it doesn't make sense. It doesn't give you good data. You're not using the data effectively. Lot sizes, if it's a half acre, if your property's on a half acre, try and find other properties that are a little bit less to a little bit more, not, not two or three acres. Keep the lot sizes similar. And especially the location of a lot. Is it on a busy road? Or is it you know tucked down a side street in a, in a you know off off a busy section? Is it on double yellow line or not? So keep the location in mind because bad locations will delay the amount of time it takes to, to sell a property. Age of the home, uh, you may, all these things may be the same, may be equal, but one house could be 200 years old, which we find in this area, and your subject property could only be 50 years old or even something much similar. So keep an eye on what the age of the, of the properties are. Make sure that if it's, if it's two different ages, 100 years apart, ignore it. Go on to another comp. And how close is it? So you want to get the property, you want to pick properties that are as close as possible. Once again, very basic. We don't want to be comparing properties that a property here down the street to one that's across the state or in a different state or or too far away where it's in a totally different market. What is the condition? Has it been renovated? Uh, how old is the kitchen? How old is the bath? Is it, is it been dated? Um, what kind of things does it need as far as improving one property to the next? So, when we're looking at comps, we want to look at sold comps. Those are your strongest comps. Other properties that are like yours that have sold, not for sale and not just and not simply pending. Because when agents list properties, the price might be up here, and then it goes pending, and it might be here, and then when it sells, it's, it's down here. So when you're comparing, you're trying to find a value for your property, you want to look at the, the most accurate data, what is it going to sell for? So you want to find out what those light properties have sold for. And how recently did they sell for? How recently did they sell? Was it in the past few months, few weeks, or was it months and months ago? Typically, you, in this market, you're going to find comps that have sold in the past three months, and that really should be your target. If you're going back 12 months or six months, it might be a very difficult property to comp. This is particularly common for your old property. Say that house that's 200 years old, um, that's just very unique. You may not find very good comps that have sold recently. 
you may have to go back more time to find more options to get better comps. So depending on what your subject property is, you may have to adjust your criteria and look at your length of time or the distance. You have to make some adjustments. You always want to know um, it, where your, your property is. Is that area is that area hot? Is it cold? What's the typical market? Are houses selling quickly? Are they taking a long time to sell? You want to know what the trend is. Is the values going up or down? So every listing will have two, indi two indicators on it. A DOM, which stands for Days on Market, and a PMP, which is Property Marketing Period. Those two things tell you how long the property is on the market or how long it was on the market in, until it sold. So it's a good indicator on how quickly things are selling. And that's from the time that that's from the time the contract is signed to the time it closes. Well, well, the, con the listing contract signed until a agreement of sale is signed. So marketing time from going out to the public to it going under agreement with a, with a buyer. That's the, the start and finish of the DOM. Property marketing period is. Um, it goes through listings. Maybe someone put their home up in January and it didn't sell, and then you know there's a six-month contract with their agent, and th th it didn't get sold in that time, so the, that contract came down, and then a new agent put a new listing up, and um, they con they continue to market it. So that would be the PMP. It's, it goes through multiple listings. So this is an example of what a listing on trend looks like. At the top, you have the address, uh, the distance from your subject property, uh, what class is it, it's residential, it's active, it's a single two-story type of home, colonial, contemporary. If, you're, if your subject property is a ranch, you want to compare it to other ranchers or other one-floor homes. Maybe capes if you can't find ranchers, but keep the style and all, all factors as close as possible. This is a 421, so it's a four bedroom, two full bath, one half bath. So that's that's how that breaks down. It's listed in green at 279, so that tells me it's an actively um, marketed property for 279,000. So basic information in the listing, the listing number, the township, the, the subdivision name, uh, the lot size, this gives me the, uh, the acreage and then even the width, the road frontage is 68 feet, and the property depth is 98 feet. Tax ID number. If it's eating kitchen, there's no basement, public water, public sewer, type of heat. And over here, it shows me the days on market. 153 days on market with a total marketing period of 537 days. Now, this was back in 2011. You look at the the date at the top. So that's telling me that that property, with that listing, took 153 days up until this point, it's still on the market. And the, the other one, the, the similar property, similar bedrooms and baths, similar price, same township, same lot size, probably in the same neighborhood. This day's on market, 415 days. So this is giving you an idea that you know, maybe your subject property is in an area where it might be difficult to sell, or it may take you a long time. So you always want to pay attention to what is the market doing in that area? What's the days of market? What can I expect for a timeline to sell properties? You want to know. Uh, the MLS is really your best place to get that because we, we can tell you what that property market period is. Websites like Zillow and Trulia, they won't tell you. They doesn't tell you. So, a few other things I want to talk about. Um, when a property gets listed on the MLS, it goes out to the 20, 28,000 agents in the area. And then it goes to Zillow and Trulia and all those other websites through List Hub. And that can take three, up to three days later. So there's, a bit, so <clears throat> there's oftentimes a delay. Maybe not so important when you're looking at comps, but um, very important when when there's a buyer that wants to be um, notified right away when new properties show up. Just know that there is a delay with those websites. That, uh, it may not show all the available properties 
um, up to that moment. And um, as for repairs, I think you mentioned in the back a, a way to look at uh, a quick, easy way to look at estimating repairs. Here's a sheet that actually goes through every feature of a property and what the rough value of, of replacing or fixing that would be. So this is a helpful um, tool to use to estimate your repairs if you're not just wanting to guess. Maybe this is a tool that you want to use initially when you're walking through the property with the seller and just take some notes. And then after you do this a couple of times, maybe you'll be comfortable not having to do these things uh, or using this tool and maybe you'll be able to do it on your own. I recently had a property that I put on the market in, in uh, Northeast Philly. And the, the property went under contract in two days and sold it for a good price, a very good price. Properties were selling in less than 10 days. I kind of told 25 properties that sold in less than 10 days. And, and I knew when I put it up that I was pushing the value a little bit. But the appraiser didn't go through until a month later. Well, that was last week. He calls me on a Friday and, and essentially threatens to kill my deal because he thinks the value is too high. He said he, he, he's, he, he's calling to tell me that he can't find cops. He's going to tell me that everything that he's finding on the MLS for the price that I have the property under contract for to sell and surrounding is, is a nicer property. It's got newer baths, newer kitchens, and it's the value that I'm at or a little bit above. So he's, he's just telling me that, you know, this deal isn't going to work. And he's, he's calling to tell me that, you know, I, I better find something to help him out or the deal's dead. So I had to take two hours of my time to go into the MLS. And thankfully, I know how to use it very well and very effectively. And I could look at the same 25 comps that he was looking at and then look a little bit more with playing with all those factors and features that I was showing you guys in the previous slides and really zero in on the square footage, the age of the home, the location, and play with that data. And I was able to come up with three comps that were very similar in condition, dated properties uh, to what my subject property has and condition, age, area, recent data, everything. And I wrote those three down, I called them up, and I gave them the MLS numbers. And after looking at them, I said, oh, wow, you're right. I, I think this is going to work. So here, here's an appraiser that may have been too lazy to do his job. Maybe he didn't want to take the time to really use the MLS effectively, or he, he just was too stuck in how he does his, uh, his estimates. But. Um, Knowing how to use the MLS can really save save the deal. Was that uh, that deal sounds familiar? Was that scale? Yes, it was. Huh. You didn't even tell me, huh? I took care of it. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was it, it. Was it was pretty alarming because in in this market, hmm. homes are selling very fast. Put up on a Thursday, it was sold on Saturday. Twenty five showings, multiple offers, and it's aggravating because. You, you're getting, a good, as, a, as a listing agent for a seller, it's your job to get the most money possible for your client. Or in your guys' situation, you guys want to get the most money possible for yourself. Or have the most accurate assessment of value for yourself. So my assessment of value was spot on because I got the property sold to a qualified buyer at a great price. And then the appraiser wants to um, find a way to, to shoot that down because they're, they're, they, they don't believe it, so to speak, you know, or they can't find qualified data. He may, maybe he looked at ten properties and said, you know, all these other properties are in better condition and for for the same price. This just doesn't make sense. But he didn't really look hard enough. Ultimately, is what it came down to. Well, thanks for doing that. Sure. Because I was in Florida and uh, I got this listing and I exactly yeah, helped me out and I'm sharing the deal. So does that, everybody have an understanding of how the MLS works or any <coughs> questions? It's, it's something that is talked about a lot. You hear a lot, but don't often get you know some good quality information on it. As an agent, when the appraisal comes in lower than site conditions, what do you do to try to challenge the appraisal? Your best 
opportunity is prior to the report coming in. The, in this particular scenario that I was talking about, the, the appraiser called me before the report was finished. They have a deadline. They have to get all their work done and the report submitted by their deadline. If they get all the work done and submit that, that submit the, the, the appraisal and don't have a discussion with the listing agent or the seller, then it's very difficult to fight. But if, it, if the conversation starts early, it's easier. Because now, like I was saying, I can go in, I can do my own homework, double check his work, and find what he missed, and then supply that to him. So now the, the issue never gets to the report. It's corrected ahead of time. And appraisers, you know, it usually takes two weeks for them to do their job. Uh, the first week they go out and they photograph subject properties and then they go through the, the, the subject property that they're appraising. It literally takes them 15 minutes. You know, it's a 500 hour charge, four to 500 hour charge, and they're in and out of the property in 15 minutes. Most people don't realize that. But they're going through the property, they're photographing every room to prove that there's a room there and what the rough condition is of that room. And then different requirements if it's an FHA loan or USDA or conventional. And the, the last thing they're doing is they're sketching the layout of the home to provide to the bank. That, hey, this mm -hmm. is the layout of the living rooms over here, the kitchen over here, and this is the shape of the home. That's what they're doing. Once they do that, once they have the interior inspection and they have their comps lined up, then they figure out, okay, this is what the contract price is, and this is what the comps show. Is this value justified based on what is going on in that neighborhood? Um, and then they'll make some adjustments with my similar properties and new value adjustments to get it. But if an appraisal comes in low and the report comes in low, it's very difficult to fight. You can submit your own comps at that point and it goes through a review to see if you can challenge it. Um, but it, it's usually slim to none that you can get things corrected. They, at that point, they have to have missed something glaringly obvious uh, to, to, have, to be able to rectify it. They're very difficult to fight. Years ago, the loan officers could have a conversation with appraisals, appraisers. Nowadays, they can barely do that because they could get in trouble for, for influencing value. Because back in 2008, lenders would call appraisers and say, hey, I need us to appraise that X. And they would go out and appraise it as X and they'd get more business. Good old days. You were good old days. <laughs> could you? Could you have uh, provided the comments of the appraisers before you got to the point where you questioned you? And Certainly. You have that? Certainly, yes. If the, if the property shows any concern, which in this case, I had very little to no concern, especially considering how hot the market was. But I could have printed out comps, the listings that I was showing you guys back here. I could have printed these out and had them on the counter on the kitchen and highlighted you know, the similarities between them and everything that, that justifies the value in this property. Here's a property over here that sold for more and it had a worse condition or the, re or the reverse that support my value. And I could do that and leave them for him and essentially do his job, right. you know, essentially. Then he just goes home and double checks it and, 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 and that sort of thing. We do that on unique properties where we have a, an upfront concern. In this case, in this neighborhood, Everything was selling for what they were asking for, and like I said, they were, they were selling in days. Home just selling in days, so it wasn't. It was a big surprise. This was the last place I thought I'd, I'd get challenged on an appraisal. Certainly. Are there any particular styles of home that you're noticing take longer to sell, or are kind of becoming obsolete in the modern age? Um, you, most homes are selling if they're in good condition, good locations. The ones that linger on the market need a lot of work, or maybe they have a tough layout, or maybe the second floor, maybe it's an old home and the second floor has a short ceiling. Things that don't show in photos, you know, that, that you don't know until you go and look at the property. Homes that are in a good price range, uh, say three to 400,000, good bedrooms, great condition, but it's on a busy road. You know, a double yellow line, or it's too close to the road that dissuades buyers. Um, anything that's out of the ordinary and very unique may be difficult to comp and put a value on and also be maybe difficult to sell. 
um, or expensive properties in that same three to four hundred thousand dollar range that don't have a garage. You know, consider what your competition is. You're in a price range that that families want to buy and live in. You have to look at what other homes, what features other homes provide in that price range. Typically, in that price range, you're going to get a two-car garage and a nice yard and a great school district, and you know, or at least two baths. And if your home at that price point doesn't have those things, then you could be potentially looking at a difficult time selling it, more time on market, or you know, looking at giving a discount to get it sold. So back to that estimating sheet. If you fill it out and you use it, give the contractors. It's great for them to, to look at that sheet, pair it up with photos that you took through your inspection, and then they can give they can verify your estimates of what it's going to cost and give you, you know, give you their quotes. So spread it around, you know, share your data with them so that you can get um, you know actual numbers on it, what's going to cost to fix it. <coughs> 